So that's really the dangerous part um, when a lot of patients go to, you know, traditional offices that are non-holistic. Um, you know, they're basically drilling out the mercury filling. There's no protection for them to swallow it. And then also that vapor is also released into the air to staff and the patient to breathe it in. So, and it also, you know, can sit on the skin um, and the body as well and on the face. Most people don't understand that mercury is a neurotoxin. It'll, it's a toxin to the whole nervous system. It can shut it down completely. Well, welcome to the Taylor Method for a Pain-Free Living podcast. This is Dr. Derek Taylor. I'm here with my special guest, Dr. Elizabeth Keith and Dr. Trupti Lafholm, and they are holistic dentists in uh, West Palm Beach that are also a part of the IAOTM uh, Association, uh, which is for holistic dentists, and they are certified in um, mercury removal for uh, people that are looking to remove mercury fillings, as well as a whole host of other certifications and qualifications. But welcome to the show. It's great to have you guys on. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Yeah, great to be well, here. There are some people here on the show that have never even really heard of holistic dentistry. Like, what is holistic dentistry? So I'm going to ask you a question. Can you explain what holistic dentistry is and how it differs from traditional dentistry? You want to... I can answer that. Sure. Um, I mean, it's a, a forward way of thinking, a philosophy. It's not really, a, a, I guess, a, a different specialty. It's just a philosophy that we have that we look at the oral health system, how it's connected to the individual, the whole body. Um, and then we just provide the safest, uh, environment, the least toxic environment to give them the goal that they're trying to accomplish. Great. Okay. Uh, and how does your philosophy of holistic health extend to dentistry? I take it you guys are uh, kind of bent towards holistic health. and Yes. Um, I think for holistic health, I think it's really just starts in the basics. Um, just understanding nutrition and understanding what we're putting in our body. And if you're focusing on the mouth, it's what we're ingesting, but also, and how it affects the mouth, but also if you're having any treatments done, is it biocompatible? Is it safe um, for the tissues in your mouth? But also how does that extend um, to the rest of the body and can it have any ill effects or good effects? Um, so really it just starts with kind of understanding that we're all linked completely. And it's not just, you know, um, when you visit a doctor that we're just looking at this one specific area. Mm -hmm. And I think if we think about holistic that way, more of like, like Dr. Keith said, like a philosophy instead of, you know, a specialty like that, I think we can all get a lot out of it, um, patients and ourselves. Got it. That's interesting you say that because, you know, with the dentist, you know, you think of dentist, they just focus in on teeth, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and yeah. so you have this approach that's looking at the whole person what influenced you guys to have that uh a thought that you know those thought processes and that philosophy in the first place um dr keith do you want to go or i think we well, both have i, I think yeah. it was more you still would see patients that were ill uh, coming back to the practice and you were thinking, well, what's causing their illness? Why they're having all these chronic illnesses? And even though they're seeing their physician and they're doing what their physicians are saying, but still they're not getting better. So I think there, there's obviously a link between oral health and the overall well-being. Uh, and we're seeing that connection more and more. People are understanding that there is a link there. It, it used to be like, oh, dentists, all they do is take care of your teeth. But now mm -hmm. it's so much more and more patients are looking for that. They they want to be well. They don't want to have these chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think it's just to go off Dr. Keith, I think people are also looking for preventive as well. So even mm -hmm. to prevent illnesses, um, a lot of times we have patients who are coming in 
which is a big refreshing change where they're saying, you know, I don't really know what holistic is, but I found, I'm, I find myself here and I just want to do better for their families. And, and then we educate them on what holistic means. And a lot of times this is really a lot of our patients. So it's kind of nice to see that change versus, you know, only seeing the people who've kind of gone through this big illness. Now they're looking at the prevention to say, okay, I don't want to, you know, have these conditions or I want to just do better. And we're able to address those patients and introduce their families to it. Right. So when you talk about holistic dentistry, you're, you're really talking about there's, there's different components here. You have a component of how, how their lifestyle is affecting their oral health. Right. But then there's also the flip side of that. You have the component of what you're doing as a dentist, the, what you're doing to their mouth also has an impact on their health. Correct. Right. Um, it, I think it even comes down to what we place. Um, a lot of times we'll see, um, you know, mercury fillings in the mouth and how that can, you know, be linked to conditions in the body. Um, and then, you know, being able to remove them safely um, and, you know, being able to see the benefits of that as well for patients. Right. So if you put some type of metal in the person's mouth that it's not biocompatible with their how their body responds or resonates with it, that can have health yeah. challenges. That can create health challenges for them. And I'm, and I'm sure this is what you guys deal with on a daily basis, right? You're you're seeing this on a daily basis. Can you think of like some just recent patients here that you can think of that this has had an impact on? They've come to you from traditional dentistry that they had some type of procedure or metal or some type of traditional approach that has affected their health in a in a way that has not been beneficial for them well I, I had a patient just yesterday she's been in the practice for over 20 some years and she was telling me her story yesterday um, that she had gotten went to an office to get her mercury fillings removed but it was do done, not done in the safe way. And she was getting all these different sim symptoms. Uh, she was breaking out in a rash. She wasn't able to walk. Mm -hmm. um, and as of, of that, even as of today, uh, she's gotten better, but still has to use a walker to get around and she's wow. in her 50s so this she said yeah this happened years ago she didn't know any better uh and it has affected her long term wow well mm -hmm. most people don't understand that mercury is a neurotoxin it'll it's a toxin to the whole mm -hmm. nervous system it can shut it down completely and so when you start to put that type of metal in somebody's mouth it's interesting when you guys remove it it's not that you can just flush it down the sink or flush it down the toilet, right? Mm -hmm. There's a whole special procedure what to do with that metal once it comes out. What is that procedure? Like when you remove mercury, what are you required by law to do with that mercury filling? So, so typically in traditional offices, there really isn't a law that says that it has to be removed in any specific way. So that's really the dangerous part um, when a lot of patients go to, you know, traditional offices that are non-holistic, um, you know, they're basically drilling out the mercury filling. There's no protection for them to swallow it. And then also that vapor is also released into the air to staff and the patient to breathe it in. So, and it also, you know, can sit on the skin um, and the body as well and on the face. Um, so there's no procedure to protect them. And there's no really a law to say that we, that that needs to be done. But um, we go a little further because we know it's a neurotoxin and the effects of it. So um, Dr. Keith and I, we use a certain specific protocol where we actually drape the patient um, completely head to toe. Um, we use a barrier so that protects any anything that's released in the mouth. It doesn't, they're not swallowing it. And then we also have a special vacuum in the room that is one is close to the patient's mouth that sucks up everything that's released and then also in the air. Um, and we are also draped head to toe. So the patient's protected, the staff and the environment are protected. So nothing is swallowed. And um, we also use um, chlorella and glutathione to be able to make sure that we can um, help detox the patient as well. Right. 
Well, I remember being in high school when there was a, a, th- a mercury thermometer would break in the classroom. I mean, they would they evacuated like, you know, the, the plague was being <laughs> released in the class, right? Yeah. Because of the dangers of the mercury. They understood the importance of that. But it's amazing how they'll, they'll put yeah. that. In. They're still dentists that are putting that in the mouth. And I know it's a it's a sturdy metal lasts a long time. So it's a matter of convenience really than looking for the thinking more long term and thinking about the benefit of the patient. Right. Yeah. And even years ago when first uh, mercury fillings were being placed, I think dentists were really against it because they knew how toxic it was. And um and that was, I guess, back in the barber shop days mm-hmm. when because they were so convenient, like you said, and it was less expensive than gold at the time. Mm-hmm. But then the ADA was created and they shut that down. Mm-hmm. And so now every, most people are getting um, mercury fillings. And yeah, it's it's really a shame. Oh, you still still you still have patients that come in that have just recently had mercury fillings put into their mouth. Oh yeah, and there's still mm-hmm. dentists putting them. Yes, as of today. Yeah, and which then, is shocking. Have, um, when you guys do a questionnaire, then do you do you ask questions like, hey, since you've had these, does that because they the ADA I, or I, I assume I don't know, it, enlighten me on this, but. My understanding is that with traditional dentistry, they say that, yeah, mercury, they acknowledge that it's a toxic metal. However, when we put it in your mouth, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't create any problems. Is that what their viewpoint is? Yes. That's the ADA's ADA's point. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And so, but what happens when that is actually put into the mouth? Okay. So it's not in this liquid form anymore. It's hardened. It's become hard. Does that outgas? Does that become more problematic when you eat when you do hot drinks or cold drinks or under times of stress? What are your thoughts on the issue of having actual mercury in the mouth? And have you seen patients that have that you um, have suspicions that they may have some health um, related issues because they have active mercury in their mouth? Yeah. So when the mercury is placed in, um, it is, you know, solid and the mercury filling, but as we grind, as we eat, as we chew hot and cold temperatures, a mercury vapor is released. Um, so daily you can be swallowing it for years and years and years and years. Um, but you know, the ADA will say, Oh, it's a small amount or that it's not toxic, but we know those, those constant, effects on the teeth and the mercury, um, release it into your system. And it actually gets incorporated into different tissues in the body and, um, organs. And so that actually cause can link to conditions. So that's where I think the ADA stands, but that's what we know as the IOMT by some of the research that's been out there. And, um, a lot of patients can also go on the IAOMT's website and, you know, really find these research articles and be able to really kind of um, look around and see what's out there on mercury if they're looking for a resource Mm -hmm. um, comparatively to the ADA. So moving from the topic of mercury, yeah, thanks for for pointing us to that resource. Um, Another area that we see in traditional dentistry that there seems to be controversy is is on the topic of fluoride. what is your stance on fluoride and um, uh, as a holistic dentist? Well, we don't we don't do any fluoride treatments in our practice. We don't recommend any fluoride products because uh, fluoride accumulates in your body. It's a it's also a neurotoxin. And it has long-term effects, neurological. Uh, so that's also from the IAOMT site. Um, they've done a lot of research on fluoride, and they really have a strong stance 
against uh, fluoride, uh, water, water fluoridation, and not using fluoride. Mm. It's everywhere. I think, right? Oh, yeah, it's everywhere. I think it's also chemically made, even. And now there's so many sources of it. I think when it first came out um, back in, I think, 1950s or 40s, something like that. Um, I don't, I think it was just at a small level and it was very localized fluoride, but now it's in so many resources, so um, many that pay, so many products, even that I think it's at higher levels that patients are, um, and, you know, having the fluoride ingested. Um, so it's, it's has different effects, but we don't use any fluoride in the office and don't recommend it. And really fluoride is not something that's needed for tooth development or growth. Um, it's not a nutrient that's needed. Um, at all for you to be able to have a healthy mouth. So why is it so pushed by traditional dentists? So when it first came out, um, you know, in the U.S., it was because we had so many cavities in the population. And um, I think what was being done was it was going to be placed in the water. And today, I think there's a change where now it's not natural fluoride it's chemically made fluoride uh fluorosilicates is i think what it's called and natural and man-made fluoride. correct correct and then also we also have different you know resource sources that patients are exposed to with fluorides like pesticides soil um there's a large list as well online that we can find that patients can if they are really looking to eliminate fluorides from you know their environment or what they're putting in their body and products, they can actually go on that source and, you know, start taking steps to do that as well. And that's something we go over with our patients as well here. So can, if somebody, so there's just people listening to this to go, wait a minute, I always thought fluoride is good. I get fluoride treatments on my tennis. It's all over my toothpaste <laughs> thing, you know, fluoride mm -hmm. you know, in it. And there's, everybody looks at that as like, this is a major preventative or protective against cavities and whatnot. Um, if somebody has had too much fluoride and they've it it is you said it's a neurotoxin have you are you able to identify some common symptoms or symptomatology or health challenges that people have that you can think well i'm just wondering if this person is their body is uh um has too much fluoride in it they've been they have this is like a toxicity for them, and this is what's happening in their health. It's what are some common presentations that patients will have if you if that is possible? Is that something that you can spot or see? That's difficult to diagnose um, right. and to accurately say. Oh, sure. these symptomatologies are from fluoride toxicity. Um, but I know long term the effects of fluoride in, in the body has created a lot of uh, issues and long-term effects. Uh, like it, it is a neurotoxin, so you are going to have illnesses such as maybe Parkinson's, tremors, um, memory fro uh, fog, uh, just having a lot of memory issues where you can't remember things, maybe di dementia, just those sort of things are mainly linked to fluoride toxicity. Yeah, right. Yeah. Anything that has to do with the nervous system or any condition. Exactly. So we have, there's, there's mercury that's a common uh, thing that it's in traditional dentistry, fluoride. Is there any other Anything else that you guys see or um, differ on when it comes to traditional dentistry that is com a common practice in traditional dentistry? Well, we talked about uh, mercury and we talked about fluoride. There's also a periodontal disease, all the different bacteria that causes gingivitis, uh, periodontitis. They're very um, chronic inflammatory bacteria that we're seeing also is linked to, I think, about 57 systemic diseases. Uh, I mean, th the common ones are heart disease, diabetes. Uh, now they're to 
um, low birth weights, but now they're seeing a, a link to cancer, to Alzheimer's disease. So yeah, it's it's a big deal. So talk about that a little bit. Unpack that a little bit because um, you talk about the the bacteria. I think her mating drops. Your yeah. Can you let Tripsy in? Oh sure. Yeah, you bet. So. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit more in regards to the bacteria? And in- well, specifically P. gingivalis, uh, they've seen it in um, that it's it's a very chronic inflammatory bacteria that's linked, like I said, to heart diseases, to diabetes, because it's so inflammatory, and all we hear is about oh chronic inflammation is the cause of so many illnesses. Yeah. But, you know, we're seeing chronic in- inflammation in the mouth. If that's not taken care of, it's affecting other systems. Right. So what are the, the what are the signs or symptoms that you see that that has somebody that has this bacterial overgrowth or Oh, they have bleeding gums. Okay. Um when they most patients say, "Oh, my my gums bleed when I brush or floss, uh, bad breath. They have, when we do our exam, we can see some bone loss um, and they have hard minerals deposits on their teeth and plaque. Mm. So. And so what causes that? What causes that overgrowth of the bacteria? Is it an imbalance in their gut flora? Is it the food they're eating? Is it stress? It's all of those all things. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Their diet, nutrition, um, their pH imbalance in their mouth, their microbiome mm-hmm. in their mouth. Maybe it's their coffee drinkers or tea drinkers <laughs> or alcohol drinkers, right? Something that's going to disturb the acid, mm-hmm. alkaline mm-hmm. balance. So, so now with traditional dentistry, then they they see the... How do, how do they look at it differently than how a holistic dentist would? Because I think they both agree that this bacteria is bad, right? But how how do you guys take it a step further in helping a patient overcome this issue? So I think both traditional and holistic, holistic dentists will agree that, yes, it's a problem. We see the inflammation. Really, yes, it's decreasing the inflammation through nutrition, um, making sure that we're giving them good home care instructions on how to keep their mouth clean, but also seeing a dentist for professional cleanings um, on a regular basis. But we take it a little bit step further by saying we can do um, some additional methods like ozone treatments in the office um, that help to kill the bad bacteria, but also um, decrease inflammation. And that gives better healing to the tissues in the mouth. And then also we can introduce methods like PRF, um, where we draw blood in the office and centrifuge it and be able to put the PRF in areas that have a lot of inflammation in the gums so that they also heal better. Um, And it reduces the inflammation a lot faster and more comfortably than having antibiotics placed in the mouth as well. So it's a lot more natural um, using your own body to heal you as well. What's PRF? Uh, Platelet-rich fibrin. So it is, we oh, draw like, your blood. Yeah, it's like what you do, people do for- center. Mm-hmm. Yes, it has the growth factors in the white blood cells that help um, reduce the inflammation in the mouth and heal a lot faster for the patient as well. So if somebody has a bacterial problem like this, will it cause the gums to recede? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, That's so- one of the signs. Because one of the solutions um, for that, uh, my understanding, is grafting, right? They take tissue and they'll, they do a surgical procedure. They'll take tissue from one area and then they'll add, surgically add to the gums uh, in regards to, is that, am I, is that correct? As far as- It depends. Um, If the gums have receded, it really depends on how much um, has receded. Um, We can't say if it's pretty severe. Um, We'd really have to look at it with an exam to see if that's something that we can do by adding um, a graft, a gum graft back where there's recession. But, um, you know, what happens with 
I guess the inflammation in the mouth is it really deteriorates the bone levels underneath. And that's really what holds our teeth in place. It's like a foundation for um, a house is really important to have that strong structure. Same thing for our teeth. We need good bone to hold our teeth in place. But if we have a lot of inflammation, it decreases our bone levels in the mouth and it also causes um, bad bacteria to stay there longer. And then we are not able to keep our teeth as long. And so that's why it's really important to have less inflammation in the mouth and good hygiene. And then also, you know, how do we reduce the inflammation in a way that can be maintained? Yeah. So how can they do that then? How, how uh, can they prevent or can they eliminate this bacterial overgrowth altogether with a good, healthy lifestyle and proper nutrition? And if so, what do you advise your patients to do to, let's say somebody comes in, they have this problem, um, you take care of the problem, you address it, and you say, okay, Mary, from this point on, this is what you need to do. What is it that you tell them? What is it they need to do to prevent this issue from ha happening on their things that they can do on their own? So if we have a patient who comes in, you know, I usually tell them, couple of things depends. Let's say they're not doing anything at home, just the basic brushing, you know, once a day, a lot of our patients will say, Oh, I brush once a day or twice a day. Yes. Very important to do the brushing. Um, and we usually recommend a non fluoride, you know, option toothpaste, um, and a rinse, um, and then daily flossing. And, um, we take it a step further. We also have, um, ozonoided oil, um, that really helps with tooth sensitivity and, um, helps, remineralize the teeth, um, really for those early, maybe cavity lesions or any early lesions that can be in the mouth. So typically a traditional dentist may say, Oh, we want you to use, you know, a lot of fluoride products. Um, we instead can say, we will recommend an MI paste, which is a different, um, homeopathic paste that we can place in the mouth, or we can even, uh, use ozone oil, um, which is basically an olive oil or hemp oil that is ozonated. Um, that can help remineralize the teeth. And then um, I really like a rinse called Stella Life. Um, it's a gel and a rinse that they have online and it's really a homeopathic rinse and it's, you can use it daily. And I even tell my patients, if you swallow it, it tastes good. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything to you because it's completely homeopathic and it really helps with any inflammation. Um, really in diabetic patients, that's a great um, rinse to use because they do have a lot of inflammation in the body as well. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, that sounds great. I love all the natural approaches and remedies. You know, um, I know that when you guys are going through dental school, there's like evidence-based treatment. This is all the science says this, this, and this. How do you balance that out with some of these natural remedies that you guys are using? Because there's not a lot of, there may not be a lot of research that's going to be pouring into the benefits of like <laughs> ozone, right? There's no money in that, right? <laughs> in regards from the in, in regards to some of these issues. So how do you balance that out? And um, how would you respond to the traditional dentist critics that are saying what you guys are doing is not evidence-based or? Um, I would say we incorporate uh, natural products like homeopathics, mm -hmm. um, into traditional dentistry because we do have to practice dentistry right, yeah. it's the same <laughs> you know traditional holistic the mechanics of it is the same you know if there's a cavity we have to remove the cavity the you know traditional way holistic way it's the same the only thing we incorporate other things like ozone to remineralize the tooth. Uh, we use biocompatible materials that are non-toxic. So I think that's the, the difference. We're still doing the same mechanics, but we're incorporating things that are holistic, homeopathic remedies, natural things, toothpaste, rinses uh, to help the patient. We're not just throwing, you know, like, oh, take take a pill or take these antibiotics. Right. It's more of a natural approach 
in, in that aspect. And I love that because there's some people that, hey, all they want is traditional, right? Just give me the antibiotic. Yeah. Give, I just put the mercury in there, whatever's cheapest. And hey, you get, there's there's people that want to, that, that, that subscribe to that. Hey, no problem. You have a free country. <laughs> you can do whatever you want with your, your health, right? You're responsible for your own health. But now you're providing something that's an option here. You're making, you're bringing in awareness. You're providing other options. There are people that are sensitive when you start to put these some of these metals or start to do some of these things, or they're sensitive to the mercury or the fluoride. They they see it, they acknowledge it, they recognize it. And hey, I want something more. I want something. And that's what you guys are providing for them. You've been listening to the Taylor Method for Pain-Free Living podcast. We hope that you found great value in this episode. For more information about the Taylor Method and our offices, visit www.drderektaylor.com. Make sure to tune in next week as Dr. Taylor will be providing more knowledge and resources about pain-free living.